Hi, welcome to Off Script. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we are doing our big 150th episode. Woo! Yes, I don't believe it. All right. I know. I'm very excited. You survived brought- so long. I think I blew out my microphone on on the big woo, but it's fine. Hey, yes, 150 episodes of Off Script, 300 films reviewed, something like that. Maybe not actually 300, but close, I'm sure. Uh, I figure we'll talk a little bit at the end of the show about our our, our feelings and thoughts about how it's all (laughs) been. But uh, real quick, any initial impressions? What do you think? 150, man. It's a big day. Um, yeah, it's been incredible. We've seen so many movies. Uh, we've seen a lot of trends come go. You know, we saw the, the rise and fall of movie pass, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, day and date releases, uh, premium video on demand, you know, like there, we've seen a lot of things that the rise and fall of DC and rise again, you know, yeah. uh, the end of, of, you know, phase one, two and three end game, uh, with Marvel. So it's, it's been quite the, quite the ride. It's true. It's been quite the experience. I never would have thought when we started this 150 short episodes ago uh, that I would be no in the know from everything to what's in the theater now to popular trends to telling people at my wedding that you are technically actually a doctor. Yeah, that is true. And that you are the <laughs> Dr. Draper. The Dr. Draper so, is there. Uh, we'll talk more about the big 150 at the end of the episode. Right now, we are doing a blowout of a show. Three reviews In one episode, we said we would never do it again, and here we are doing it again. (laughs) So it's going to be a bit of a long one today, but that's okay. We've got kind of an amended show to uh, get us through these reviews, hopefully, and keep us timely. Uh, First, we're going to look at the Suicide Squad. Very excited. We took a watch, and uh, we're going to let you know whether or not it's worth your time. We're going to look at The Green Knight, David Lowry's uh, cinematic vision made manifest by A24. We took a watch. We're going to let you know what we think. And we also took a look back at Old. I know it's been out for a couple weeks, uh, but we talked an awful lot of smack about this movie. It seemed like we wouldn't be doing it justice if we didn't actually bother to go see it. We did, and we'll let you know if it's worth the price of admission. Uh, we're going to look at some trailers, some things that are coming up. And of course, before we get to all of it, we need to look at the news. Our first story, Idris Elba joins Sonic 2 as the voice of Knuckles the Echidna. Andy, this came out like just now, right? This is right before we started the show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh... The first Sonic was a big hit. It was probably one of the last big hits before uh, the, the pandemic era. Made over $300 million, uh, at the box office, so real big success. Um, sequel was greenlit right away, and we knew that Knuckles was going to be in it, but it, we didn't know who was playing them uh, until until just this afternoon. And, of course, Idris Elba is, is going to lend his voice talents to this. He's phenomenal in pretty much everything. He can't get do a bad performance, so I think it's a good choice. Yeah, I, I think it's a solid choice as well. Uh, I've, heard some, I've heard some people saying, oh, we should do a vo- the voice like uh, the character he plays in The Wire, which shows that I haven't seen The Wire because I would know his name. Oh, the slipper or something? Stringer, Stringer Bell. Stringer Bell, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I can't speak for Stringer Bell, but what I can speak for is that Idris Elba is a solid actor. And the first Sonic, the first Sonic movie was not that bad. I feel like the internet really wanted to not like it, and it really wasn't that bad. I think he'll be an asset to the second one. And uh, Knuckles the Echidna is a is is a beloved character in the franchise, right? Like, how how could he be bad? He's a gruff and tough kind of individual, maybe a little street, as the Broccoli family might call him. Uh, you know, I think he'll be good, right? It'll be great. It'll be great. So. Yeah, and I was reading in, in this article that uh, you know Knuckles is initially uh, an enemy or a bad guy in the uh, Sonic verse, and then eventually kind of they become friends and make up, and he joins the team. So that's right. We, we got a character arc built in here. That's what it's all about. It's all about making friends on Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, our next story: Warner Brothers commits to an exclusive 45-day theatrical window with AMC for 2022. I'm gonna be honest. We've been doing 150 episodes of this show, and I still don't really know what this means. So I'm hoping Andy can break it down for me and the rest of you. If you're at home, Andy, AMC Television, Warner Brothers Media, what is this day and date thing they're talking about? Okay, so the way things are right now is that HBO slash who is owned by Warner Brothers, uh, they do what are called day and date releases, and that's where they release essentially the hybrid release, both in theater and on HBO Max, same day, no extra cost. Uh, so that's day and date release, basically at home and in the theater. Um, the the results have been kind of mixed. Uh, you've had things like Mortal Kombat and uh, King Kong, uh, Godzilla vs. Kong do very well. Uh, but then you've had, uh, we're going to talk about it in a minute, Suicide Squad not do so hot and some other properties not do as well. The theory is, or one of the theories is that the 
um, that the the home release is cannibalizing the theater release, which is probably true to a, a certain extent. But there's a lot. There's a number of other kind of uh, there's a couple of other options or issues going on there. But that's day and date release. Uh, what this means is that uh, starting in 2022, we're not going to have day and date hybrid release anymore from what we'll have a uh, kind of what's become the new tradition is the 45 day window about six weeks where the theater will play exclusively the movie will play exclusively in a theater before being available for rent rental and, and streaming and all of that so uh this is a big change because it used to be 90 days um and this changed over the pandemic but you know the, it's kind of a pendulum at we swung all the way to same day release and then we got away you know we were at 90 days so this is kind of somewhere in the middle well i don't think it's bad i guess i should say uh as as a consumer i love that day and date films have been available on hbo um it's been really nice it's been really easy to watch stuff especially considering the pandemic you know if you don't feel safe if you don't want to go out brave brave the crowds uh wear a mask good news you can watch stuff at home it seems like that's going away and and that's okay you know like it, it was a bit of a pipe dream to assume that this was just the way the future is going to be um but man it's it's going to be weird uh not having that next year and it's going to be weird with hbo having a little less hbo max having a little less value right like not getting these sweet day and date deals but i suppose it's all right i'm bummed to see amc getting away with another one dude i I'm, if if anything 150 episodes of off script has taught me it's that i don't like amc theaters <laughs> and i used well, to work for them which is crazy well it i mean this isn't set in stone i mean this is this is a deal for one year just like the day and date release was a deal for one year we'll see what happens at the end of 2022 also did no one's said a word about Disney. Is Disney going to continue to do day and day releases with an additional charge? Uh, we don't really know. So, uh, you know, not everyone has to follow this model and, you know, they're still figuring out what is kind of the best model given the circumstances. That's true. Um, I wonder how Warner Brothers will look in the rear view uh, come 2022, how they'll look back at this kind of move with HBO. I mean, I know... On the legal side, it had ramifications this year, pushing everything to day and date. I mean, I, I know they they caught a lot of flack from critics. People in Hollywood said they didn't want to work with Warner Brothers because they were just pushing stuff straight to theaters. Like it was a whole thing when they announced this uh, at the end of last year. And 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 it's been great on the consumer side for me, but I can definitely understand their desire to get back to something more regular. If anything, I do like the 45 day window. That sounds way better than like the whole 90 day wait, you know, three months to get stuff at home. That's it's ridiculous. So this seems like a, a decent compromise, which ultimately, you know, that's, that's what a compromise is. It's two yeah, people I, it's not getting good, what they want. It's a good step. I think ultimately we're still headed to day and date. One, it may, it may be five years, might be 10 years, but eventually that's probably going to be the model. In in a way, I think that maybe Disney has the right idea where, okay, you can watch it at home day one, but it's going to cost you. Um, so we'll, we'll see. It and we'll, I mean, these things are continuing to develop and change and uh, that's good. We'll stay tuned see what's going on. That's true. Keep it here on Offscript for more. And uh, last review, Suicide Squad opens to a lowly $26.5 million as moviegoers stay home amid delta variant andy suicide squad was a bomb didn't you hear it was a flop they, they they blew it it was it was a horrible failure or was it what do you think well it it hit below estimates which were around 30 million so it, it came in disappointing numbers no one expected this to be a huge hit like you weren't going to do uh black widow numbers or marvel numbers uh you know it was a weird semi-sequel semi-reboot to a film that did okay uh, the first one made over $100 million, but, I mean, it's still kind of a flop uh, by those numbers. And DC was really lost their way for a bit. Uh, also also COVID. I mean, th there's a lot of reasons why this isn't doing very well. And it, it was available at home, so a lot of people probably stayed home. But, I mean, the numbers are still pretty low. So even the cannibalization of through HBO Max is probably, you know, you're not going to get 30, 40 million from not showing it at home. Um, so, it, so it's a little disappointing that way, but it was critic. It has been critically acclaimed. It's been very positively reviewed by both uh, critics and audiences alike. Yeah. And we'll get to a review in, in just a second. You are right though. It has been critically acclaimed, which is good. It's a good sign for what we're going to talk about. Uh, regarding, you know, the, the box office numbers, it's worth mentioning Warner brothers only predicted this was going to make about 30 million. 
So this is only like 3.5 below what they thought it was going to be. So no, it's not exactly a big flop. We of course don't know how much they made on HBO Max, like with the with the day and date release there. Um, for all we know, they could be doing a lot better. Uh, you know, those, those numbers are unclear, and they're going to keep them internal, and it's fine. The the big indicator of whether or not this movie worked is whether or not there will be another one. And just just from the critical reception, I feel like there will be. It may not be James Gunn at the helm. But I feel confident saying people think this is one of the better DC entries. And ultimately, that's going to matter more like it that that will that will have the longevity to carry your franchise. You know, if this was just another flop, it'd be a big miss. We all sigh. We, we move on. But this came out and I think a lot of people were interested. And I think that means that ultimately, yeah, it may not have killed it at the box office, but there's also a new COVID variant on. Right. What matters is the cultural uh, the cultural buy in. And they've got some here with James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. Yeah, it, it's a lot of people have, have watched. And I, again, we don't know what those streaming numbers are like, and we'll probably never know. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't want to get too much into the review, but it, it's a fun time. And a lot of people have watched it. And I would definitely, you know, get, get in line for a third one. Yeah. Well, with that, let's jump into the review. I suppose that's the best place to go. Uh, Andy's graciously agreed to take the summary on this one. So, Andy, please take it away. The Suicide Squad. So this is the latest reboot slash reboot slash uh, remake slash semi sequel to uh, 2016's uh, Suicide Squad, originally directed by David Ayer. That movie had really mixed reviews. Uh, it's really kind of bad. I did rewatch it before seeing this, just for a comparison. Um, it's a snooze fest. It's hard to get through. There are some good performances in that one. Will Smith is good. Margot Robbie is good. Uh, but they went back to the drawing board with this, and uh, you know they really kind of ignore the first movie. Like you know, we have some familiar characters, but they don't reference anything in the first movie. That there's no plot points or anything moving forward. It's just kind of like let's just start this thing over. Um, so anyways, our story is the Suicide Squad, for those who aren't familiar, are a group of criminals, of villains who uh, get contracted to do black ops work uh, and get time off their lengthy prison sentences. However, if they disobey or try to escape, uh, a little device implanted in their head will explode at the request of Amanda Waller, played brilliantly by Viola Davis, uh, who was in the first one as well. In this one, we start at... Uh, this country called Corto Maltese, a fictitious South American country, which the Suicide Squad has to assault in order to uh, take on this secret scientific project that must be destroyed so it's not unleashed on the world. Um, as soon as they hit the ground, a lot of things go wrong, some things go right, and they have to slowly make their, their way through the island to, to the, the facility. A lot of action, a lot of laughs. Um, and that's kind of our, our basic setup. I won't get a too much more into it. We have, again, returning favorites. Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, uh, Joel Kinnaman as Rick Flagg, Jai Courtney as Captain Boomerang, and newcomers Idris Elba as Bloodsport, and John Cena as a Peacemaker. And part of what they did is they don't have a lot of big names in this. In fact, they, they kind of went to, purposely went to the bottom of the barrel of characters and took on the challenge of making them interesting. So we have people like Polka Dot Man, like Ratcatcher, like I said, Peacemaker, um, these kind of really weird off uh, off the beaten path DC characters. Um, and, you know, they took on the challenge of making them fun and, and interesting. So that's our setup. Zach, what do you think? Uh, so first of all, the Suicide Squad is much better than the original Suicide Squad, for sure. Uh, I've tried to watch the old Suicide Squad a couple times now, David Avery's uh, original film. Uh, it is bad it's bad i can't i can't i've tried i've fallen asleep twice trying to watch that, that film uh in the evening uh meanwhile james gunn's the suicide squad is much much tighter of a film uh it's got some middling audience reception it's got like a b plus um but critics mostly agree this is a strong entry for dc and a very very good uh step towards something better for them uh, I think James Gunn is a big part of that. I think his cast is a really big part of that. And I think ultimately like Warner Brothers just letting off the reins a little bit and saying, okay, you know what? Here's a bunch of characters you can just throw in a blender. We don't care, you know, <laughs> and, and letting, letting the creatives kind of do what they want to do. I think ultimately produces a much better film. Remember Avery's suicide squad in 2016, I think. Yeah. Um, 
reportedly had a lot of studio intervention and this one reportedly had much less and i think it is markedly better for it i'm excited to talk about it there's a lot of good stuff going on in the suicide squad yeah the number one thing is that it's just a lot of fun you know it's not a serious kind of you know it's not like the dark knight and it's not dark and grim like a lot of dc's uh, early early dceu films are we're having fun from the from the beginning with our our characters uh there there's a lot again there's lots of action a lot of people do not survive the film i'm not gonna <laughs> who who that is is uh, you'll have, have to have <laughs> yeah but but you really don't know anyone could go at, at any time uh, and that's a lot of fun uh as well but it's it's really funny uh there's a lot of really good jokes it's also it's it's rated r which uh part of the reasons it has very very strong violence and that kind of it's different for DC and it also, it, it really help aids in the humor. Cause you have this like over the top, really graphic, really gory uh, moments. And then amongst these like fun comic book characters. Yeah. Um, I, 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 this movie in a lot of ways reminded me of, you know, something smaller budget and a little bit more indie, like, like an Edgar Wright film uh, almost, or, or like a Sam Raimi picture. And, and uh, I also often thought of the movie, I guess the property, I should say Watchmen which if you haven't seen Watchmen, uh, it's about, it's a, it's a DC property or it's yeah. a vertigo. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's about a bunch of, of superheroes who, um, have to kind of contend with some larger, larger beings at work. Uh, most of them are not mainstream. You're not going to see Batman or Superman and Watchmen. You're going to see smaller offbeat, you know, heroes who are kind of doing their own thing. And that's exactly what's going on here. There's a couple of big ones, you know, Harley Quinn, Bloodsport, I suppose is a big one uh otherwise like uh, pretty small heroes and i love that this movie doesn't shy away from like just outright murdering them like for a laugh <laughs> yeah. um and it's great because you don't get that in comic book movies right now you don't you get the exact opposite of that like every hero has value i mean in marvel show marvel movies and shows nobody dies nobody's everyone's ever back. really no, gone no, everyone's no coming back really <laughs> yeah, and in 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 James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, like people die horribly, and it's it's playing for a laugh, and like it's funny because it's fresh and it's new and it's different and it's brutal and grisly. This is an R-rated film uh, for violence and gore for sure, and 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 I love that. <laughs> I love that about it. I love that it feels different. Um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, wh where to start? Well, uh, I mean, I think we've already kind of covered that this is a follow up from the original. Uh, I, you know, having not really seen the original, something I was really impressed with was just the opening of this film. Uh, it opens with a short, probably 10 minute sequence that very quickly outlines why they call it the Suicide Squad. Right. And and, and we open with a character who is being plucked from this kind of prison uh, that they're that they're all being kept at all these all these bad guys. And they get a quick explanation. If you survive the mission, you get 10 years off your sentence if you don't well that's the way it goes kid uh and they all sign up to go out and do it and then they land on this beach at night and then like awful awful things start to happen to all them all hell breaks loose yeah yes all hell breaks loose and you get a very practical explanation to why it's called the suicide squad because the odds are you're not coming back like if you sign up for this mission the odds are you're not gonna survive and I love that because it, it makes it feel very genuine. The first film, it felt like they were using Suicide Squad as a moniker to generate some buzz for marketing. Here, it's like, no, no, you I, will die and it'll be terrible. Like, and, and, and nobody would want that fate for themselves. Welcome to the Suicide Squad, yeah, kid. I think in the first one, only one person dies in the Suicide Squad and it's like a Z-list character. They don't yeah. even get, get like a backstory moment. Um yeah, that's the other thing that this movie is much more efficient. Like it explains the whole premise in about the first five minutes, you know, do this mission, get time off your sentence. If, if you disobey your head gets blown up and that's it. In the first one where there was like an hour of like slowly explaining every character's backstory. It took like an hour for them to become the suicide squad. And then they had to like take on something. It was so uh, laborious. And here this movie's moving. It's moving really quick. We do get some backstory and some flashback stuff, but it happens after kind of we've had some action and, and we get, get, we're up and going. Yeah, you also spend very little time uh, at this facility where they're all being held captive. I mean, m mere moments of the film take place there. Otherwise, it is exclusively on location on the, at this site at the court at the Cordo Maldives that you said. Yeah, uh, where they are dealing with this, uh, you know, suicide mission. I should say. 
and that that's a lot of fun like that stuff feels really fresh you, you've got you've got your characters mostly on location and even though i'm sure a lot of it was in sets it felt like they were away from a set it felt like they were out doing their own thing you know it didn't always feel like they were wandering through the woods per se but like it definitely felt like our characters are on a mission they don't have a whole lot of support behind them they kind of have to figure it out for themselves and they're like this goofy cavalcade of people with like the oddest powers and and positions like one you know poke polka dot man's easy to poke fun at but like at one point like, he starts to look like disfigured and <laughs> there's never really a great explanation for that and, but it's like a laugh like and then yeah you've got another character mon gal she's a laugh because she's weird and you never really find out what her deal is and like I like that this movie doesn't overstress that stuff. Like it, it, it explicitly is designed as like, Hey, this is going to be like a bad guy, a superhero, bad guy, meat grinder. And we're just going to throw a bunch in best superhero, bad guy wins. Let's see what happens. And then they come out the other end and it's like, man, what, what an experience. Um, you wouldn't think it would work on paper, but it totally does. Yeah, it, exactly. It's, it's just, it's so much fun. And you know, they took on the challenge, like something like polka dot man, which is just like a, such a ridiculous character. And they purposely took him on and said, "Okay, we're gonna make this character fun and interesting, and kind of, kind of give him some some heart here." And, and it totally works. And it, they do that with with the rest of this uh, cast of misfits um, as well. And somehow you end up just caring more about these characters and a lot of the the one the big names in, in the major in the main more mainstream films. Yeah, James Gunn said that when he kind of sat down and looked at the Suicide Squad and what he wanted to do, he wanted to pull from this kind of original vision of the Suicide Squad in the comics, like, and that there's this innate tragic element to supervillains who aren't even good at being bad. Like, they're not even good bad guys, right? Like, they're not even like the Joker who's out, like, terrorizing Gotham. They're they're the bad, bad guys. They're, they're, the, they're the really bad ones. So, like... You develop this kind of funny sympathy for a few of them over the course of the film just because, like, <laughs> they're, they're total rejects. Like, they're not even good at being bad guys. And, like, you start, you kind of start to feel sorry for a few of them, which is great. Like, that, that sympathy helps you develop better relationships with people like Harley Quinn. It also helps you develop relationships like people like John Cena's The Peacemaker, who will be going on to have their own HBO show. Um, a spinoff from this property, which is crazy. Uh, I like that this movie gives you the opportunity to get inside the head of somebody with superpowers in a totally different, fresh way. Um, because yeah, like there's somebody you in a weird way have sympathy for, like you don't feel bad for them, but like you, like you can sympathize, I guess, with like their struggles. Yeah. The, I was going to say they work so well as, as a, a cast, as a team, uh, not, not actually work well together, but it's, there's so much, um, just, uh, you know, good dialogue between back and forth. It's like the opposite of Justice League because Justice League is like we have to band together and save the planet. And these, like these, everyone kind of hates each other. Like Peacemaker and Idris Elba are like having a pissing contest the whole <laughs> the whole movie. They both like get on each other's nerves. Idris Elba is just like, man, we're just gonna die out here. No one's like this is gonna go so wrong. Like his attitude towards this whole thing uh, is really great, and just like the camaraderie and. It, it works really well and makes for a lot of good gags. Yeah. Cena's peacemaker is a delight. I mean, he's a ton of fun walking around set. Cause he's this guy with this just like total bluster about everything he does. Like he's somehow the best at doing it when it's like, not only are you in prison, but again, you're not any kind of a list bad guy. Like you're very low on that. In fact, it's not even clear why he's a bad guy. You'd think a guy named peacemaker would be a hero. Right. But that part never real. Well, you have to watch it and well, see if it comes. To well, I mean, the, I guess. I mean, the, the main reason is like his name is Peacemaker because he cherishes peace over everything. And, but that means he kills a lot of people so that there is peace, <laughs> you know? Right. It's yeah. kind of like, uh, you know, if, if you want peace, prepare for war kind of. For <laughs> sure. Um, uh, Idris Elba's blood sport is in prison for shooting a kryptonite bullet at Superman. Um, you never see that sequence. They just say it in a throwaway line and then they move right along. And that's okay because it's not about Superman. Like, and it's not about blood sport shooting Superman, right? It's about this like goofy kind of misadventure. All of our, all of our, our miscreants are going to go on Harley Quinn. Uh, it, regarding the timeline, I should say with birds of prey, this is sometime after birds of prey. It's not really specific. Um, I forget mm -hmm. how that's identified. Um, I felt like I read it in trivia somewhere, but that's, that's where this is. So she's kind of doing her own thing. She's a little bit more grown up. She's got a outfit that's based off the, uh, Batman Arkham city game. 
a little bit more mature, uh, which is nice. Uh, we've got King Shark, um, voiced inconspicuously by Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, who would have seen that? Probably the big, or, or probably the biggest name on the cast list. Yeah, is not even at the top of the credits. Like they don't, they don't advertise him or anything. Um, Rat Catcher Two is a lot of fun. Uh, that is who plays her. That's a uh, that's a great g- gag. Uh, so Rat Catcher One is not here, but we have the. I think it's the daughter rat catcher too and they, that's right they, have, they go in a whole explanation about how how and why that is but it's 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 those little jokes like that um, i want to talk a little bit about more about uh margot robbie as harley quinn it's been really interesting to see the evolution of this character because when she came out in suicide squad she was a she was a hit just because harley quinn's harley quinn margot robbie's a fabulous actor and they also just like put her kind of in the most ridiculous costume in that first movie like she's basically in like stripper wear the, the daddy's it, little princess outfit yeah yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. and i mean she basically everyone else is in costume she look, looks like she's in cosplay you know like it's like she's wearing these like super short shorts like really revealing and it's like you know and it caused a big deal by like look at how like men are dressing up as character it changed a lot when she did birds of prey and when she had a lot of say over how the character looked and dressed and that's carried over in into this because again we, we've moved past the her relationship with the joker and like she's she's got a cool again she's got this big red dress that she kind of wears and fights in the, this whole time it's not like this overly sexualized thing so it, it's been an interesting thing to see that character progress yeah, seeing her kind of grow into her own is is great. Uh, Peter Capaldi as the thinker is solid. I, you know, I know that man's an actor, but I'll never understand the the confidence he has to show up on screen with like the goofy headgear he's got in this movie <laughs> yeah. and still like be be some kind of menacing or interesting. Like he's definitely like snively and and weaselly in this film, but um, he's 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 not brash about it. And Viola Davis is tremendous as as uh, Amanda Waller. She's kind of this antagonist driving our characters forward with her hand on the on the kill switch uh, throughout the whole film. And she's a ton of fun. Um, everybody's good in this movie. Like solid performances all around. I think the comedy plays really well. I mean, it's not. It's it's just about a gag a minute, and obviously when you're looking at a gag a minute film like Airplane, right? They're not all going to be hits, but a lot of them are funny. Like I, I laughed out loud more than a couple times when I was watching this film, and like that's that's worth saying something. And the yeah, action and, is very solid. Yeah. Well, I was going to say uh, before we move on to action that I I, I started rewatching this uh, yesterday, and I got about through the first hour, and I still laughed at uh, some of the same jokes that I like knew were coming and knew that because it's still like really funny and really uh, good writing. But moving on, action. Yes, uh, the action for this film is brutal and gory and bloody and a lot of fun. Um, It's nice to see superhero characters just kind of unloading, even if these are the B-list, right? Even if these aren't the good ones. It's it's a little dull when you see Superman just punch some some heroes, some bad guys out, and it's like, well, here they are, officer. Sometimes you want to see them go off a little bit, right? And like that's exactly what's happening in this movie. Uh, all these characters are throwing 110% at their problems physically. Uh, if they need to shoot somebody, they're not just going to shoot them. They're going to figure out a way to blow their head off. Like they're they're going to always figure out a way to have some kind of horribly gruesome, gory experience that's usually played for a laugh. Um, I know that sounds into like counterintuitive, but I promise it kind of works in this crazy, crazy uh, mind meld of a film. Uh, I love how colorful it is. And, and I guess that'll be more towards cinematography regarding action. Uh, what do you think, Andy? Yeah, the action is a lot of fun. Again, it's over the top violence. Uh, and you got a little bit of everything. You got shootouts, you got hand to hand combat, you got uh, kind of uh, people using their powers and a mix all, all there between. Uh, Harley Quinn has a really great um, sequence. I won't say what kind of sequence it is, but she's got a really great action sequence about halfway through the film, uh, which is really awesome. And it's it's cool to see her do it, her own thing. That's kind of, that might become a staple because we see that in uh, the Birds of Prey movie as well. Uh, what's up? The, the Harley Quinn like action. So yeah, she has got her own sequence. Yeah. Which honestly, the one in Birds of Prey is better. Uh, this this one is a funny way of, of of kind of the cinematography and the action is kind of interesting. I th- felt like Birds of Prey had a really clean uh, series of like action direction and stunts performed, at least in the initial Harley Quinn Harley Quinn sets. 
This one's a little bit faster in, in the cinematography. James Gunn really likes to whip that camera around and gets a little nut, nut get get a little nuts with it, which is a lot of fun, uh, but but a little jarring, I think. But for the larger action scenes, I really appreciated the look of them. Um, the cinematography in this film is really solid. Uh, Gunn has he, he usually plays it pretty safe uh, with his camera work, but on occasion he'll do something really cool, a pull trick or do something different or kind of show something in a way that's unique. And, and that stuff stands out. Like I said, in, in parts of this, it feels like an Edgar Wright film. It feels really bold. It reminded me uh, the, the, the the mix of, of gore and comedy reminded me of like Hot Fuzz, the way Hot Fuzz will play 10 laughs and then have something horrendous happen to a character and then go right back to the laughs. Um, and this movie does that same thing. Uh, there's a great sequence in the end of this film. It's kind of the, kind of the climax when our characters are getting out of this car and, and they're kind of kind of walk into this big this big showdown. And it's raining and it is like supremely sunny while it is raining and it's so sunny it's just like solid white in the background. You can't see anything but like the characters and the car and the rain and then just like this white field of nothing behind them, and it makes no sense. It makes no sense in the real world for anything to look like that, but it looks so rad. Like as they're walking through it and King shark like rips a dude in half in it. And it's the coolest looking shot. Um, there's all kinds of cool things. And, 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 and the, the big bad in this film, I think is, is notable because it's much less forgettable than I feel like 90% of other comic book bad guys are right. Typically it's just some CGI fest, some nobody alien from another planet who's here to take over the world. This one it's just a little different, and it's really smart. Yeah, that, that's, part. that's part of what went really bad in the first one is, again, the first hour is spent on setup of the Suicide Squad, and then all of a sudden there's some attack, and it, one of the members, uh, Hunt, Huntress, Enchantress, she turns bad and like releases her brother, and her brother becomes the big bad, and he's just kind of like this god thing, and it's, yeah, it's completely forgettable. I have no idea what that thing's name is, is or was. I only remember because I just watched it like last week um yeah it, yeah we have a really unique very different kind of uh antagonist we have and we have kind of several antagonists amanda waller is an antagonist uh, a little bit uh, herself so um yeah it's very memorable kind of final showdown yeah and um ultimately like a solid package uh i did like the music in this film i think it's worth mentioning it's a big indie soundtrack it opens with a johnny cash track and that's about the most mainstream one i think is in there um, otherwise, it's all stuff I've never heard. Uh, very, very James Gunn, right? Like somebody's listening to on his iPod when he's walking around sets, uh, and that's great, you know, because it makes it feel unique, gives it a bit of an identity, and has way less needle drops than the original film did, which I know hurt it. So yeah. Um, and and any, any thoughts on the soundtrack? I like the soundtrack. There's a couple of good songs. That was another big problem in the first one is that it was essentially trying to rip off Guardians of the Galaxy, which had a great soundtrack. So they tried to throw every pop, big pop song in from the last like 10, 15 years in. And it was just, it didn't work. And you knew exactly what they were trying to do. The songs didn't really fit. And there were so many. It was like every time there was a new scene, there was a new hit song that we'd already heard. And it just, uh, it was pretty bad. And so this definitely shies away from that. We do get a couple of good N n numbers but they fit they fit the action what's happening on film so much better that's true and uh, overall it's it's a solid package i think i think james gunn managed to put something together here that's really unique uh it seems like a nice shift from what he was doing with guardians a much more like pg-13 kind of kind of film uh this one he's way he's got way more clout to just throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks you know and and it works i think it's creative i think it's new i think i think honestly between this and Shazam, uh, maybe a little Birds of Prey, maybe a little Wonder Woman. I think DC is starting to eke out maybe a bit of a direction here that's not Zack Snyder. Like they might be, they might be on their way to finding a tone and a feeling for a world of superheroes that is different from what Marvel is doing, but feels fresh and new and and easy to embrace. Zack Snyder's Zack Snyder's DC is a world of gods and men. This is a world of men yeah, and great. idiots yeah it, exactly <laughs> men and morons and like <laughs> i think when the world is jaded from too many comic book movies like maybe that's exactly what we need so that's the suicide squad uh, Andy, any other thoughts for final recommendations i'm ready andy would you recommend the suicide squad absolutely it's a lot of fun you don't have to have seen the first one uh that's another bit kind of criticism of marvel is like you kind of have to have seen all 18 20 films 
to know what's going on. You can jump into the Suicide Squad, uh, have not having seen any of the DC stuff, you're probably better for it, um, and still have a lot of fun. Uh, it's available again in theaters and on HBO, so it's a lot of fun. I highly recommend. Yeah. Same here. Highly recommend. It is really solid. It, it is rated R, so big content warning. Uh, you're going to be getting into some, you know, you're going to be seeing some 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 gruesome stuff. Um, but it's never too serious. It's never it never takes itself too seriously. It never it never expects you to really it look inside yourself and have an introspective, you know, uh, consumerist experience about what it means to be a superhero and a god among men. Nope, never does that. It's just this goofy, like 110 minute romp uh, <laughs> with the Suicide Squad. I recommend it. I think it's funny. I think it's fresh. I think it's different. I enjoyed it. I think we will see James Gunn's The Suicide Squad in the uh, in the first few initial offerings. When you scroll down HBO Max and look at DC movies, this one will be one of the first ones on there because it's popular and, and I think it's positive and I think it's good. So that's The Suicide Squad. And, and with that, we need to jump into some trailers, some things we're going to see uh, or have seen on the internet that we're going to be seeing later. Uh, let's jump right into it. Andy, you want to uh, transition for us? It's time for the trailer park. So we're going to try to go through these quickly because we, we got three, two more views. A long trailer, a long show. It's fine. Um, to still do. So the, la the first one is uh, called The Last Duel. Um, and this is... Uh, a period piece uh, starring Matt Damon, Adam Driver, Ben Affleck, and uh, oh, I can't remember the newcomer, a woman. Uh, but this is takes place in in medieval times. Uh, Jody uh, Comer is the the woman. Uh, Adam Driver has been accused of sexual assault by uh, Jody uh, Comer's character. And uh, so that leads to a duel between her husband, played by Matt Damon, and him. We don't know who's telling the truth. We don't know who's lying, but we know someone is. Um, this looks really gritty, really grounded. Uh, obviously, lots of themes about uh, sexual assault and, you know, belief and believing women and things like that. Um, I think this looks great. This comes out on October. Super excited for it. Zach, what, did, what do you think? So the thing I, I'm most interested in this trailer uh, about seeing one, uh, you know, nothing, nothing wrong with Adam Driver in like a suit of armor, solid. Uh, two, Jodie Comer looks like a lot of fun as a newcomer. I know she's been in Killing Eve, the television show, and most recently we'll see her in Free Guy. Uh, she's the woman who I thought was like Emily Blunt, but is not Emily Blunt. That's that's Jodie Comer. That's her. Uh, she's she's the person opposite opposite Ryan Reynolds with the red hair. It's her. Uh, um, yeah, I know you wouldn't even recognize her. Like I just assumed that was somebody else. But yeah, uh, the thing I, I I like about this trailer is I like that. It's underrated, man, but Rid Ridley Scott does like old stuff like this really well. He does period piece as well. I mean, Gladiator, uh, what, Kingdom of Heaven, I think was him. Yeah. Like, he does this stuff well. You may not remember them that well outside of Gladiator, I mean, but he, he does he does period pieces like this really well. So I'm excited to see him kind of get back into that space. The thing I don't like about this trailer, and I know I said I'd keep this quick and here I am. I think it's really poorly edited. They do this thing with like silhouettes when like swords where they like cross over black. And I'm like, all I can see is no footage. I can see 10%, 10 percent of what you shot. And then I can't see anything else because you're not showing it. And it's frustrating. And I hope it doesn't take off like Hans Zimmer and the Inception soundtrack on trailer did and like become a trailer meme. But uh, otherwise, it looks all right. Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. What's not to love? They did write this, which is a little concerning. You know, they also wrote uh Good Will Hunting, which might be great, but yeah, written by Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, directed by Ridley Scott. Anything could be happening in the last duel. Our next trailer uh, is for the new A24 film called Lamb. Lamb uh, features uh, Numi Rapace and a couple other uh, stars who I've never heard of in a film by Vladimir Johnson. It is overwhelmingly Swedish, I'm going to say. I think it's Icelandic. 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 Yeah. It takes place in Iceland. Here, here's the summary. A childless couple, Maria and Ingvar, discover a mysterious newborn on their farm in Iceland. The unexpected prospect of family brings them much life and much joy, but something is unique. Something's odd about this young babe of theirs, and that it's half human, half lamb. Uh, the trailer's really something else. Uh, it's yeah. it's very atmospheric. It's very introspective. It's a little funny. It's got some unique sound soundtrack choice. It is an A24 movie in every sense of the word. And I hadn't seen the trailer of this before I went until I saw Green Knight and then I saw it on the big screen for the first time. And I was like, man, this is this is the reason people go to A24 movies because I don't know what I'm going to get when I go see Lamb, a movie about a half 
half person, half lamb, but I know I'm, it's going to be weird. And like, that's exciting. Andy, what do you think of the trailer for lamb? Uh, this looks great. Uh, again, you, the setting is really interesting. It's out somewhere in rural Iceland and it's uh, these people are like sheep farmers out in the middle of nowhere. They've had kind of family tragedy, either the death of a child or unable to conceive. And, and then they, they become obsessed with this lamb child. Well, it's unclear if it's like, half and half or if it's just like a lamb that they all see, lamb see, yeah. see, see is there but like it gets gritty there's guns there's blood we like it's all basically i think everyone's gonna lose lose their minds a little bit like the lighthouse or the shine and everything everyone's just yes. mad by the end but we it's exciting because i don't again what is it actually going to be about like what are the themes and, and meanings uh as yet to be seen so i'm excited for this it's really twisted new rap pace is, is always good mm-hmm and that leads us into King Richard, which is uh, about uh, Richard Williams, the father of Venus and Serena Williams. Uh, so it's like a semi-biographical uh, uh, film, but it's it's focusing on their father. It's not about Venus and Serena Williams, which kind of pushes me the wrong way. That moves me the wrong way. Uh, but anyways, the trailer does look pretty interesting. Like I said, he, he plays their tennis coach. He's working with them to play tennis and that grow up not just being good tennis players but being black in a very white space and what that means for them and this is, comes out in, in november it's got oscar written all over it um it's got a good cast on bernthal dylan, dylan mcdermott uh also in it uh that, and again another will smith vehicle he he plays richard blooms i don't know if i mentioned that anyways zach what'd you think um, I, I knew this trailer was coming, um, uh, back when HBO announced or Warner Brothers announced uh, their day and date releases with HBO through all of 2021. This was one of the trailers they had, or this was one of the titles they had. Hey, this movie King Richard is coming down the line. It's a Will Smith vehicle. He's, he's, he plays Richard, Richard Williams, the father of Venus and Serena Williams. Got it. And, and I remember seeing that and going, that's cool. He's totally not the story. Why would I care about the dad of Venus and Serena Williams, right? Like, I want to see Venus and Serena Williams, or just one of them. Just pick one. I don't know, like, and go that way. But uh, regardless, this trailer has come out. I've given it a watch, and I'm interested because I love Will Smith, and it looks very inspirational, and I, I, I think tonally it's smart. Uh, I don't understand how the movie is about him, though. Like, that's, that's the thing that hasn't come clear to me, and I, I think that the film will probably do a better job of explaining that. I don't understand what his... Yeah, I mean... I don't no, know. I, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm just like, why isn't it about the girls? Like, why isn't, in the trailer, why aren't we seeing, like, the names of the child actors that are playing them, you know? Yeah, and I mean, like, I mean, hey, here, here's what this is, and it's like, no, it's just about him, and I can't decide if the movie is about him because you genuinely have an interesting story to tell about Richard Williams, or because you got Will Smith and you were like, shoot. <laughs> Will Smith is in our movie. Maybe we should just kind of frame it around Will Smith. Who, like, I, I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, I'm there's interested not a to lot see. Of, yeah. There's not a lot of... Uh, I, in fact, there's no like female sports biopics that I can think of, so I don't know why you would make I, I Tanya. <laughs> that's the only one I got. About black women, though. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I cannot think of any. Yes. Um, so, you know, this is a real opportunity to highlight the two stars who are one. I mean, I didn't even know his his first name, for instance, you know. Right. Uh, so, and it's, you know, it's one of those things, it's going to be about them, but also about him, but you got to get, you know, I guess he was the name. But yeah, th like I said, this rubs me the wrong way that it's not just the Venus and William, Serena Williams story. It's focusing on their coach, their dad, who is obviously right. an important figure, but he's not the star. Right. Otherwise, it looks positive. And for all I know, Richard Williams has an absolute story worth telling. Like, But it, the trailer doesn't do a great job of showing that. It just is kind of like, here's the two stars. And then in the background, this is who's the who the movie's about. And it's like, that's weird. So I'm interested to see it. I, I, I'd like to see more. Um, you know, being that it's not a big cinematic feature, this might be one of those ones that's prime for staying at home and watching on HBO. But we'll see. Um, I'm excited to see it either way. Yeah. And, and, and thank God Will Smith's getting some more work. Good Lord. That man, man needs to be in more films. Um, our last feature we're going to be talking about in our trailer park segment is called house of Gucci. House of Gucci is the story of the Gucci family. You know them. You love them. You, something in your house probably has their name on, on it. Or something in your house probably has their name on it. Yeah. Like the Gucci family is, is, is one of, of, 
a story of heartbreak and thrills and chills. I don't really know, actually. I, I don't know a lot about it. Uh, the film is directed by Ridley Scott. I know what you're thinking. Again. Wait a second. <laughs> we already talked about a movie directed by Ridley Scott in 2021. Uh, King, uh, the, what, the Last Duel. Yes, we did. And, and here we are again. He also did this film. It also features Adam Driver, just like that movie does. But this is not a Matt Damon, uh, Rob, uh, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck production. This is an adapted screenplay uh, from a book by sarah gay forden i'm excited to see this i like the cast uh we've got adam driver jared leto we got uh, lady gaga salma hayek al pacino jeremy irons uh, we've got some solid names in here uh and it looks very exciting very bouge bourgeoisie very lush uh what do you think of the trailer for house of gucci uh, i really like this because it looks like a lot of things about like kind of betrayal and uh you know kind of warring fashion fashionistas fashion empires uh you know you definitely get this sense of like well you know that the house of gucci is old and established and we aren't going to change and there's younger generations who say well you need to change times are changing you have to adapt and they don't want to and that causes friction uh lady gaga is great i'm really excited uh for her performance and i, I saw a side to side video of her and the woman that she's uh playing in real life and it was like spot on uh, oh really yeah, so it's got it's got some Godfather vibes <laughs> there, you know. It's just, uh, you know, the the biz the family business is in trouble, and then people want to take over and overthrow and, and all these things. So uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, J Jared Leto uh, is is doing a makeup thing again. It's been a while since we've seen him doing that, and he looks unrecognizable, which is great. You know, um, I ran this trailer for a couple friends, and both of them couldn't place who he was in it, and I had to play it back for him. And yeah. they were like, oh, my God, he's that dude. Like, yeah, if you haven't seen I mean, it, it, it's worth looking at. I mean, I'm usually here for Jared Little hate, but, you know, yeah, he he, he does look good. Maybe he'll turn it around. Uh, but between Morbius and the little things uh, and actually so the Joker and Suicide Squad, uh, not a lot of love for Jared Leto here. But who knows? He could turn it around. Yeah, you might be able to turn it all around. And with that, uh, we need to talk about our second film of the episode. Like I said, we'll be doing old at the end, but for now, I'm going to be taking the review on this one. The movie is David Lowry's The Green Knight. So The Green Knight is the story of Sir Gawain, or Gawain, or Garwin, or however anybody in this film would like to say it. Uh, he is a young, aspiring knight, played by Dev Patel, who arrives at court on Christmas morning to spend time with King Arthur and Queen Guinevere and the rest of the Knights of the Round Table when uh, disaster strikes. A mysterious green knight arrives on his horse to court to play a Christmas game with any knight who'd be willing to participate. Uh, Sir Gawain steps up and he's 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 told uh, through a mysterious letter that he <laughs> has the opportunity to lay to land a blow to, to, to land a strike on the Green Knight in, in any fashion he wish, whether he simply give him a cut on the finger or he lop his fool head off. And then one year hence, he'll have to go to the Green Chapel that is six days away uh, by horseback and uh, receive the same blow back to him. And so Sir Gawain hears this and thinks, okay, I'll take your challenge. And then first opportunity, lops the Green Knight's head off. Well, turns out the Green Knight is not so mortal after all. He stands up, picks up his head, laughs at Sir Gawain, says one year hence, and then rides off into the sunset. And then one year later, Sir Gawain uh, has to make this pilgrimage six days from Camelot to the Green Chapel. I think it's six, maybe seven. Uh, to face the Green Knight and uh, ultimately face his destiny and maybe find his honor as a knight. Uh, this is a very bold cinematic vision from David Lowry. This is an A24 film, so you know you're going to be getting some creepy stuff, right? You're going to get some weird horror imagery, and hopefully it'll make you feel something when you're sitting in your theater seat. And I certainly did. Hopefully Andy did as well. Andy, what did you think of The Green Knight? I really liked it. Um, it's definitely a very challenging film. It's in you are not spoon fed what is happening and a lot of other things in the film it, it is telling storytelling through the through the mechanism of cinema which is primarily visual you are shown a lot of you are shown everything and not told very much um again the broad strokes are there he's he plays the christmas game in one year he has to go and challenge or, or you know receive the, the blow from the green knight and kind of goes on adventures uh, and has to overcome obstacles along the way but th this movie is 
just it's really dense and really deep and it's about a lot of different things that we can get into a little bit later it is loosely based on uh, um like a, a poem a medieval poem about the green knight and sir Gawain. um that's a very classical kind of you you have an upstanding knight who's you know comes to on challenges and he does the right thing because he's a knight uh you know it's very kind of elementary that that way we do not get that kind of story here. We get someone who is, who has no honor, who is not a knight, who is kind of like, we first see him in, in a brothel on Christmas morning, like waking up and he has to run, run to mass, run, run to church. And th this is the, this is our character. And then he, he's someone who has no tails. And so he must try and he, that's what he wants. He wants to try and get this, this life, but he starts out as a man with no honor and has to kind of become that along the way. So it's, it's a very different kind of telling of the tale. And there's also lots of, th there's things that, that aren't in the original um, uh, tone poem. There's uh, it's a mix of different legends as well thrown in here, as well as some uh, real life events. So some people were complaining that, oh, you know, if you haven't read it, like you, you're not going to have any background. You don't need any background. Everything that you need to know about the film is explained within uh, the world of the film. Because, like I said, there's lots of outside influences, and there's just really, if you re if you go back and do research, you're just going to notice everything that's different. Um, but there's so much tone, there's so much mood, uh, great performances, and you know, like what this is and isn't about. It like it'll keep you thinking. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. Where should we start? Gosh, uh, I think probably on the legend, right? Because that's where uh, the Green Knight kind of kicks off. It's, it starts up and it says, you know, legends of old, tales of past, uh, swords and stones, that kind of thing. Ladies of the lake. Uh, it's not, not what this movie's about. Uh, this is about one individual, like Gwen. And it's not about the Knights of the Round Table. It's not about King Arthur. It's not about Camelot. It's not about Excalibur. All this stuff's in there. But none of that is the center of attention here, right? It's simply Gwen. A young knight trying to go find his courage, right, and 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 find the destiny he seems to be on on course to have, uh, whether he wants it or not. Um, the Green Knight does a really great job of respecting its audience. It thinks you are a smart person, and it says, "Hey, you're an adult. You can you can look at something visually on screen, and you can discern your own messaging from it, right?" And not a lot of people do that. Not a lot of people like that at the movies, right? The odds are that people are going to see. Fast Nine and Transformers Eight don't want people to have to, don't want to have to decipher like their films from from the screen. They want they want it to be told to them, right? Just kind of tell me what's up, get me to the action, get me to the goods. The Green Knight does not do that. The Green Knight's a little bit more cerebral. You still get some really good action, some really good stuff, but the Green Knight expects you to know a little bit, right? Your Andy's right. You don't have to know Arthur and Legend to go in here, but it really respects it. And if you do know a little bit about going in, you really like it. I mean, you don't have to know a lot. I, 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 it does it does give you the goods right from the start. It does give you a little bit about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round. Um, but it also doesn't hit you over the head with it. You know, when when Arthur shows up on screen, it doesn't come up with like a subtitle on the bottom. It's like King Arthur. You know, he's the guy that pulled the sword in the stone. Guinevere doesn't have a label under her. I'm not even sure anybody ever addresses them by name in the film no, you, you just no, you just exactly know right. that's who it is yeah because you know what you've signed up for here like you have an idea of what the green knight is you know it's arthurian legend um there's a great sequence early on when when Gawain is handed excalibur for a moment and like this wonderful breadth of awe that kind of comes over the scene as this light kind of comes in behind Gwen as he picks up the sword and, and the music kind of swells it shows how much this stuff means to the character to Gwen how important Arthur is to him, how important Excalibur is to him, to Camelot, to being a knight, to having purpose. It shows, it just in this moment, him holding a sword, it shows what that is. And it's able to do that without telling you, look, it's Excalibur. It's the sword from the stone. Like, it doesn't have to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah remember? like, it, right. Remember when this happened? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't elbow you in the ribs and, like, expect you to figure it out. It just kind of presents it and says, hey, come along with us on this kind of whimsical journey. And then from there... We get the descent into the deep dark madness when the Green Knight shows up, and I love that. Uh, that stuff's exciting. So I, I love the way this film respects the lore and 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 plays into that instead of trying to run in a drastically different direction or say that it's something it's not. It, it really pays homage to what came before in a really really good way. Yeah, it, it gives us a Camelot of of th that's not like in its prime. We Arthur is old and he's 
you know, kind of on on his in his last years as is Guinevere. You know, when the Green Knight first shows up, um, King Arthur says, you know, my body wants to leap over this table and you know fight you, but it can't. You know, so who else among among you will take up this this challenge? And and you know, th there's also Merlin is in here too. He's never explicitly named. You just know kind of. Uh, who this is, but you know, it's, it's dirty. Again, we, we find Sir Gawain in a brothel at, at the beginning. There's, you know, animals. And stuff. It looks like an actual medieval town instead of just like the, uh, an Arthurian legend, like we would kind of imagine a very Hollywood uh, version. So it's, it's very dark and, and gritty. And I mean, like people are like, Arthur's a little hard to understand because he's again, he's old and uh, he's, he kind of has a strange accent. Uh, but again, the, this this idea of you got to get out there and do something with your life. It's a little bit of a failure to launch <laughs> situation with with Gawain and uh, his mother, who who's a uh, oh, witch warlock, uh, also has a hand in this uh, as well. But her and King Arthur's family, like they want great things for him and they want him to kind of grow up and do things like do great things. Yeah, you're exactly right on the on the kind of failure to launch. But Gwen is a young knight, and like he is, he's gone on very few adventures, right? And he has not uh, done much to make a name for himself. And he's kind of just enjoying the benefits of knighthood without actually having to put in any of the effort. So when presented with the opportunity to to defend his his crown and his king and his country, he he literally leaps at the chance, jumps up to say, "I will fight this knight. Like I I will do it. Like this is this is my burden. I'll do it." Um, and then he is is saddled with like the the immediate repercussions of having to deal with the fallout from that, um, and that's you know a, a big step for him. And then I didn't really want to see it because she loves Arthur and Legend. She loves the story of the Green Knight, and she was afraid this was going to be a lot more horror uh, because it's an A twenty four film, and she doesn't watch a lot of those. She thought, well, this is going to be scary, and and I'm I'm pleased to say it's not. Um, the the Green Knight uses a lot of horror elements. It uses a lot of horror imagery and it certainly instills some horrific tones without ever actually hitting you with like a jump scare. I don't think, I think there's kind of one once, maybe if you want to call it a jump scare. Otherwise, Laurie never does it. And he so easily could have. There are multiple scenes in this film where, where Gwen is seeing something of, of witchcraft or mystery where he easily could have hit you with an orchestra sting and cut the camera real hard and would have scared the hell out of everybody in the audience. Never does it once because it's not what this movie's about. It's, he's not trying to scare you. This is not a horror feature. This is about somebody finding something inside of themselves, plucking up the courage to be bigger. And that's inspiring in a small way. And that's not something I expected to see from the Green Knight, right? Like, you don't you don't think it's going to be any kind of a, any kind of think piece. Like, you assume no, it's going to yeah. be a pretty simple thing. But, yeah, like a, a fantasy action adventure. Yeah, what's, what's interesting is that, you know, uh, he slays the Green Knight, and in within the year, while he's he's waiting for the year to go by, you know, he kind of get, gets a little bit of this uh, legend about him. People are like, "You're the Green Knight," you you or you slew the Green Knight, um, and he gets a little bit, you know, overconfident. Fine, and he doesn't actually want to go and seek out the the Green Knight uh, for for this adventure, but uh, he's he's kind of realized, well, it's a little bit of an imposter syndrome. He's like, "Well, now I got this legend. Everyone's expecting me to do this. I can't not." Um, and so it's, it's interesting because he sets out, you know, sword, axe, shield, you know, uh, his steed and uh, things go wrong like right away. And he he <laughs> he has to then still like complete the, this quest. He can't like because everyone's expecting him to be gone for you know a week and uh, to come back with a great tale. So he he kind of has to persevere. And again, he's not he's not honorable kind of until the the end of the, the film. He's still you know kind of looking for the easy way out through most of this. But he learns kind of through uh, through trials. Right. Ultimately, this is this quest uh, of to to reach kind of this finish line. And what's so interesting is you don't really know what happens when he gets there. Right. Will will the Green Knight return the blow? Will will he lop off Gwen's head just like Wayne did to him without remorse, without question? 
Or will there be some kind of self-reflection? Will there be a moment of, no, this happened and this worked out? And I think that's what makes it so captivating because by the time you get to the, because you never know and the movie never gives you a hint what's going to happen. The whole time, Gwen's like, I really don't want to go. Like, this is this is not going to work out for me. You know, as this year kind of goes on, you get this wonderful visual of this like children's puppet show outside the castle where like, local puppeteers and jesters play up this tale of Gwen and the green knight as, as the year passes on and, and more time goes, Gwen steadily gets worse and worse, right? Because he knows this fate is, is coming for him, whether he likes it or not. And then when he sets out to kind of go on this adventure and, and, and pluck up the courage, that's when he starts to kind of come into his own. And we start to find him as a character at the beginning of the film. He's relatively unlikable. He hangs out at a brothel, right? He's doing nothing. He's handsome. But Deb Patel's handsome. Uh, finding his way that's what, that's what makes him a character worth listening to that's what makes him a legend right that's what makes this stuff last and that's what that's what gives this feeling that this gives this film such weight the feeling that there are dozens of arthurian legends like this one imagine if lowry had his chance to tell five of them you know like this is great it's a great it's a great interpretation of the legend right it, and we're talking about how he's not unlikable that I wanted to talk about a different character. Uh, Lisa McCander's in this and she plays uh, a woman from the brothel named Essel, who is um, kind of Sir Gawain's go-to uh, person. And, you know, they have a conversation before, uh, you know, before he sets out on his journey and she says, you know, have you thought about like, you know, maybe us being an unofficial thing. Like I could just, not work at the brothel and I could just be your woman. And like, it's, and it's very clear. He's not interested in that at all. He's a knight. He's from the aristocracy. He's not about to marry or have anything officially to do with, with someone from the brothel. So he's really, really unlikable uh, from, from the beginning. And uh, she, uh, we, we get to see um, her several times throughout out the film, but it's, it's a very, Again, uh, David Lowry does a great job of having us not like this guy uh, when we first meet her, or just show that you know he's not night material at all. Right, he's a kid. Like he's he's a young dude who's running around doing his thing at the local brothel. You know, whatever. Like that's that's kind of what you'd expect. So what you see on the poster, these vibrant colors and this, this yellow cloak and this big ax, like we have to find that, you know, David Lowry has to find that. And he brings us along for the ride. Um, I was really pleased with green Knight overall. I, I was really pleased with it. Um, I, I enjoyed it a lot. There's a couple of small missteps. I did feel like we start to feel the edges of the budget in some scenes. There's a lot of scenes with, 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 not a lot, but I should say a, a fair number of scenes of, of Deb Patel walking through the woods, which like, I, you're literally a knight walking through the woods looking for a chapel. Of course, of course, you're going to be walking through the woods, but it did start to feel a little bit like other films I'd seen recently, like Gretel and Hansel or, um, yeah, I thought of like Sam Raimi's Evil Dead, like with some smoke machines <laughs> just off stage, you know, just simple stuff like that. Also, uh, the film features title cards that are frankly just too hard to read. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're very ornate the way, uh, you know, a medieval manuscript would be with like tons of a giant letter and all this uh, drawing around it. Um, yeah, there was one title card that I couldn't read both times. <laughs> it's you've seen it twice and still couldn't. Yeah, right. Yeah. I saw it once and. Yeah, somebody pointed that out to me after I'd seen it. They said, hey, the title cards are really hard to read. And I, th I thought, okay, it wasn't just me. They're full screen and and they are laid over. It's text laid over like a shot. So like when there's a transition, it'll be, you know, see Deb Patel walking through the woods and it'll be a full screen text layout over him. But they're short. They fade out really quickly. And they're also so big and they're all different old fonts like germanic fonts Man. and so they're just hard to read and you don't get a lot of time they so go fast yeah exactly yeah so between that and maybe a couple too many shots just hanging out in the woods like uh, otherwise like this movie's real good it's real good man like there's a lot of really good work in this film any I, other thoughts I, for recommendations yeah i wanted to mention the the score um, oh god was, yeah of course it was the same person that uh i don't have it pulled up but yeah uh, he did the score for a, a ghost story as Let's well, which it. which is the other, and he also did "Ain't Them Body Saints." Uh, starred, both David Lowry features, yeah, right? which starred yeah. uh, Rooney Mara and Casey Affleck. Uh, both excellent films. Uh, the score is a mix of both, like medieval sounding, and also very very modern. Uh, basically, what the composer does is 
he uses period instruments like there's lots of like flute and lute and those those kinds of uh medieval instruments but he composes them in a very modern way it's very like uh, there will be blood kind of modern score uh, but there's also like traditional singing and, and things so it's it's a very like it really helps dive you dive into the world um excellent score i put, added it to uh, my ever-growing list on spotify of uh film soundtracks <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good fit then. Uh, yeah, this is scores rock solid. Very very good to listen to. And again, I, I didn't I didn't really get a chance to talk about it a whole lot, but the cinematography is really good. Um, some really solid coloring. Um, a lot of really great use of light. And I think Lowry's a big fan of the practical effects, and it shows. Like, just feels like a good solid A twenty four feature. Really pleased with this one. Andy, any other thoughts for recommendations? I'm ready. Andy, would you recommend David Lowry's The Green Knight? Absolutely. Um, a really incredible fantasy telling of, of this tale. Very modern as well. Again, the, the original uh, tone poem would be kind of boring uh, to see. So he does a very interesting treatment of, of the work. Again, there's it's the legend, but also mixing other legends and also some real life elements. Uh, it's very visual. There's a, it's a lot of things to think about. There's going to be there's still things that I'm like, I'm not real sure what that meant. Um, but it's interesting to kind of think through. And again, it's about a lot of things. It's about honor, but not like, you know, medieval honor. It's just kind of about like becoming a good person, what it means to, to really be an honorable person and, and to kind of grow up and be a leader. And it's about so many things and it, it, it's influenced by a lot of movies. I really in, enjoyed it. So highly recommend. Hmm. Yeah, same here. I highly recommended. I, I like this one a lot. It definitely does not have to be a film about Arthurian legend if you don't want it to be. I mean, I know that's kind of the framework here, but yeah, it's, it's a story about a young person who is striving to find themselves and, and, and find their purpose in the world. And uh, to, to meet this kind of expectation that everybody has of them to, to exceed it maybe. And uh, Deb Patel's brilliant in it. I mean, Laurie's doing some great work. I'm excited to see his next feature uh, would recommend the green Knight all around really solid. And with that, we've got one more film to look at. <laughs> one uh, more. How are we doing on time? Okay, all right. Yeah, we're, this is normally where we'd be wrapping the show, but you know what? We, we took a couple weeks off to get ready for 150. We 150, big. that's right. 150, yes. So let's talk about this, and we'll do a little bit of reflecting on 150, and I think we'll just about get there. Uh, Andy, are you ready for the summary? I am ready. Perfect. I just realized I had the wrong header up on Facebook. The entire Green Knight review. Awesome. It said the trailer park and not the Green Knight. Irrelevant. Andy, whenever you're ready. Old. So this is the latest entry uh, horror thriller from director M. Night Shyamalan of some such hits as almost at the Green Knight, The Sixth Sense. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, signs. I have to say all his old stuff because my, his more modern stuff hasn't, hasn't been Real great. Uh, Split was very good, and of course, Glass, the, the sequel to that. Um, we find our characters, uh, our main characters played by uh, Gael Garcia Bernal and Vicky Kreps, um, are a family going on vacation. They found some hidden resort, um, all expenses paid, whatever. They, they show up, and they're having a good time. They have two young children, and uh, the kind of owners comes up to them at one point and says, Hey, we got this secluded beach. It's really great. No one knows about it, but uh, you know, I got a guy that'll take you there. And so they go to this beach. Turns out it's not so secluded. Some other people show up with there and uh, you know, they're having a good time. And then uh, they realize a couple of things are strange in that uh, everyone is starting to quickly age. They see this primarily in their children who are, you know, six, seven st uh, immediately start growing up into like, 9 10 and they eventually realize it's happening to them as well they are trapped on this beach when they try to get off uh, they kind of get dizzy and pass out and end up back on on the beach they don't know what's going on they don't know what's happening but they know they they have to try and escape and get off before uh they essentially age and die on this beach which will probably happen in like 48 uh or sorry 24 to 48 hours so that's our our setup it's a little bit of a twilight zone thing horror thriller genre zach what do you think so I, I wanted old to be a little bit more than what was in the trailer, right? The trailer um, really came out swinging with a Super Bowl spot that was 30 seconds long that very quickly explains the beach makes you old. And that's the movie. 
And typically, like, the beach making you old would be, like, the twist at the end of a Shyamalan film, right? Oh, wait, why have we been feeling this way? Oh, the beach! The beach makes us old! That's the gag! But this movie goes the other way and just puts it right out front from the beginning. It's based on a graphic novel, and old... Ultimately, I guess I hoped it would it would grow and change out past the beach makes you old. Like maybe it gets complicated. Maybe there's like another part of the beach that makes you young again. Or maybe if you swim out far enough in the current, you can halt the effects of the beach making you old. Like maybe we can have like a temporal pincer like in Tenet, right? Like the beach makes you double old or something. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to report there is not much more than what you see on screen uh, for old. Uh, for what you see in the trailer is what you get. The beach makes you old. That's the movie. I was really I, I shouldn't have gone and expecting more than I did, but I did, and I was bummed. I, I wanted I wanted it to be more than the beach makes you old, but that's that's the movie. So let's talk about it, Andy. Uh, what's the best place to start talking about old? Well, I was going to say I had I came in with very low expectations and I was still disappointed. So it, it's not just you. Um, oh, good, great. I was worried. Yeah, great. So uh, th- this movie is it's a big misstep for M Night Shyamalan. I don't know how anyone approved this movie, uh, agreeing that this movie. No other studio. If he weren't financing his own films, I don't think anyone would have greenlit this script. Uh, first of all, the premise is just a little thin. There's not a lot there. It is you know the beach makes you old. That's it. Um, but I think it does have potential. You could, you know, you could do some, some good horror and and stuff. He just doesn't do it. And my broad stroke about this is that what M. Night Shyamalan is trying to do or what he used to to do is what Jordan Peele is doing now. Jordan Peele is the man for this kind of stuff and Shyamalan is not and hasn't been for a long time. Um, so my big problem with this is just, it's not interesting. It's boring. It's so slow in the beginning. Like, cause we know as the audience going in, we know what the premise is. And it's so frustrating because it takes our characters like the first hour to figure out, oh, the beach is making us old. It's not just the kids. And so that's number one. It's just painfully slow to get to the to where everyone's on the same page. The other thing, the depiction of aging just doesn't work very well um, because it's primarily only shown in the kids. And they kind of go from being six to being 10, from 10 to being 16, you know, so they make kind of these big jumps in time. Uh, but it would need to be a very gradual thing. I think this premise would work better in animation. Uh, honestly, something that where you could gra- very gradually show everyone aging because the adults don't really age, uh, and then they start doing some bad CGI and makeup. It doesn't really work. Um, and th- there aren't again. There's nothing really scary about this. There are eventually some some things that are more interesting. Um, where, like for instance, if you you are hurt. Uh, like let's say you break your leg if if you're aging really quickly it means you're healing really quickly which means that bone might not heal correctly like you know uh so there there are some like health related things that are interesting because you know like for instance if you have cancer and you are aging quickly that means the cancer is going to happen quickly so there is some potential here um it's just not interesting and it's not scary and it's not thrilling or any of that yeah, you, you make a good point. Like the, the gimmick has evolved on a little, like before I jump in and say, like I just did, that, that, that you know, that it just the beach makes you old. There's nothing. That's not true. Uh, if you get injured on the beach, it's a small injury. Yeah, your injury will heal really quickly because your, your cells are aging at a rapid rate and they're evolving and moving and, you know, whatever. Um, so that is kind of neat, but the movie also does not follow its own rules. Um, there, there's a character later in the film who is dispatched in a most unfortunate manner um in a way that like basically breaks the rules they've already set out and it's like okay what are we doing here like this there shouldn't be a whole lot to this the beach makes you old and there isn't a lot to it but they try to make more of it than there is i I think what's what's surprising about this andy like like you said after 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 i saw this we started talking about it i don't understand who would have greenlit this feature like who reads this script and goes, yep, that's going to work as a live action film. Cause like it, it really struggles. Like it just across the board, everything from the narrative discourse, you, you're a hundred percent right, Andy. Like it is so frustrating to sit in this film for 45 minutes and wait for the characters to figure out the beach makes you old. We all saw the trailer. The trailer says it in 15 seconds. Like it just doesn't work. Like there's a big disconnect there between like editing Bay and, and, and audience member. Yeah, and, there's... and, so much time is de- is dedicated to like, oh, well, we got to get off the beach and all these failed attempts to get off the beach. And it's just like it's wasting so much time. 
Yeah, and the film opens on them like getting to the resort, and all they talk about is things that are related to age and time. Every conversation, the kids like, "Look how old you are now." I couldn't do this when I was younger. Like it's just constant. Like all they are talking about is time and age and aging and getting older. And then they get to the beach and they start to get older, and it's like, who put this script together, man? Like, is this? They don't talk about. I mean. Additionally, okay, let me let me get off Hammer and M. Night Shyamalan for a second. Additionally, a lot of the character direction is really poor. Our two leads, uh, which is... Uh, Guy Gael, Gael, Garcia Gael, Bernal Gael. and Vicky Kretz. Yes, uh, I should know their names, but they're not they're not uh, traditionally English actors, and I do a poor job of keeping up with them. I apologize. I'll figure that out. Um, they're both really poorly directed. Um, they are our two leads, right? They are prote- they are they are our two protagonists. They should be the most exciting, dynamic characters of the bunch. They are very flat. They are very bland. Uh, the few sequences where they interact with each other are like one takes, one shots. Like it, it's like Shaman just set the camera up in the side of the room and was like, "Go ahead and say all your lines. I'm just gonna film you for two minutes. Great, let's get back to the beach." And it's like it's boring and dull, and I don't care about them. And, and and I don't really understand their motivations. At one point, one of the characters was like, well, this, this woman's sick. And I'm like, did they talk about this before now? I guess they did. I don't really remember. They did have a conversation at one point, but like, I didn't really suss out what was going on there. It's, it's a movie that I think is maybe introspective to the creator. I think, I think Shyamalan probably looks at this, thinks this is a really thoughtful piece. And it's like, ultimately it just kind of isn't, it's a little flat. Yeah. Th- this would make a better short or like I said, uh, an animated film. The other thing is, so this is based on um, a graphic novel by a French author um, called Sandcastle. And that original novel is about, it's about aging and it's about ex- and death and accepting both kind of as, as you get older. Um, this film is not about, it kind of deviates, uh, from what I've read, it deviates from the novel about halfway through. And again, tries to become this thriller instead of being like a meditation on on the aging process, on accepting death and all these things. Like that actually sounds interesting to me. That would be an A24 version uh, of this. And again, he tried to take this premise and make a a horror thriller out of it. And and it's not it's neither of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're totally right. It would work better in another format like live action is just a struggle. So let's jump into like the, the actual meat and potatoes of what's going on here. The thriller aspects of it. Outside of the beach making you old, there's not that much to thrill you here, right? Like getting old isn't thrilling. It's the opposite of thrilling. It's dull and boring and lame. Like, and, and so trying to ascribe that as a thrilling notion in this film is a challenge because you're just getting older, right? That we have a decent cast of characters on the beach. Uh, We've got a couple families. We've got three children initially. Um, And we've got something like five or six adults and a dog. Um, so we get a decent like petri dish of 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 characters of different age, range, social status status to to be engaging with the beach that makes you old, which is kind of neat, right? Uh, we get some characters who are maybe not quite in their right minds when they start to figure this out. So you so you get some people who are a little nuts, and that's exciting. You get people who are crazy on a beach that that makes you old. That's that that can be cool, sure. Uh, you get a couple weapons, right? Somebody brought a, a knife from the dining set from breakfast. Okay, now we got something going on here. Like now, now we've got some thrills. But ultimately, like a lot of it just feels really forced. Like the idea that all of these characters would be trapped on a beach that makes you old and all know, hey, we're all trapped on a beach that makes you old. And we can't really figure out a way out, which is a whole other thing that we shouldn't talk about on this show. Why they can't get off the beach. You're going to have to go see it and find out. But it's pretty lame. It's that. it's lame. Yeah, it's not great. It's thin. It's thin is what it is. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like the, the idea that all of these characters would somehow start turning on each other. is just a little forced. Like it doesn't feel natural. I'm like, I feel like if I was on a beach that makes me old with a bunch of other people, friend or foe, family or friend, I, I would be cool with everybody because ultimately we're all getting older. We all got to figure it out, right? Like we have to come together and solve our problems. That doesn't happen in this movie and it doesn't feel, it, it feels like it, that doesn't happen out of, out of plot convenience. We have to have a bad guy. We have to have something thrilling. We have to have some action. And it's like, you totally don't. The original work <laughs> didn't. 
yeah, it didn't need it, and, and this doesn't need it, and trying to force it in feels awkward. Well, yeah. Well, if you're gonna write a thriller, it's got to be thrilling, and you know this idea of something like oh, someone's got a weapon that that could be an interesting thing. It just never is, and yeah, the cast is real. It's it's this weird stereotype of people. Like there's a a, a guy who's kind of an older gentleman with a really young wife, and the the young wife is like you know this beautiful blonde woman, but she's like obsessed with Botox. It's very like it's a little misogynistic. Uh, you know, very obsessed with with herself and her, and everyone is like this stock character. Like it's like you're playing Clue, and it's like, well, yes. we need the yeah. you know, the butler, the mad. Like it, that's what it feels like. You like you chose the most stock characters you could think of and gave them the most stock things to do. Yeah, yeah, and they're propped up on screen in ways that are deceptive. Um, I know, I know, obviously, a thriller is going to involve some deception, but like. One character, a couple of characters arrive at the beach before everybody else, and you don't really know anything about them. So when our cast gets to the beach, there's two people already there. That's exciting. And they're like, wait, who's that person sitting over there? What's 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 going on with that guy? I don't know. Okay, well, we're going to find out more about him. And and in the in your seat in, in theater, you're going, okay, hold on. I know the beach makes you old. I don't know anything about those those two factors over there. Those two people, I don't know anything about. Anything could happen. Maybe they have something to do with the beach makes you old. And like, that's exciting. But that's all resolved within minutes, and and then you just left with the beach that makes you old. Um, it's confusing. It's a confusing film. I I I because I, I don't understand why it exists. The, the aging. <laughs> Let me talk about that. You you already mentioned Andy, like the the kids. They just get aged up via other actors, like uh, you know the, the 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 youngest son who's six years old after after a couple transitions turns into the kid from Hereditary, Alex Wolf. That's his name. Um, the, the, the daughter turns into Thomas and McKenzie at one point. Um, all the other actors though, all the, all the adults, they don't change into other actors, uh, and their hair does not get gray and their nails don't get longer. And, and there's a reason for that explained in the film, but it doesn't make any sense. Cause again, the movie doesn't, the movie doesn't play by its own rules. Yeah. And so they're just hit with like some cosmetic makeup, you know, they just hit them with some fake wrinkles after ever, after every scene and they just look a little older and a little older a little older there do get to be some mechanical functions with them that change up uh one character is now enfeebled as she gets older so she can't move around as effectively another character starts to lose her hearing because she's going deaf because she's getting older again kind of interesting kind of cool but like there's not enough there to really reel me in man like i, I kept thinking of christopher nolan's tenet like, which is a movie that lacks a lot of, of, of maybe emotional exposition, which is what this movie is trying to go for. But it's time mechanics and the way it plays with how time works in the film is so captivating. Jesus, I would go see it again just just to watch it and, and try to figure out what the hell's going on. In this yeah. movie, the beach makes you old. That's that's the gag. Like we all know it. Yeah. Well, well, some of the things you mentioned about like as people begin to age and it's like, yeah, their vision starts to go, their hearing starts to go because they're being very quickly approaching what is old age that is uh, that is interesting that is kind of horrifying yeah. like okay you know? yeah there's there's some good body horror in there yeah sure you know to go from w one minute you can hear and two hours later you're nearly stone dead like there there's some real potential with that bit of it but it it gets there so late and it does it so little um of it and it's just it's so it's way too long it's a full two hours yeah and it is just like stop yeah, it leaves a lot of questions. Uh, you know, if somebody's going to advance physically, do they advance mentally? Um, you know, a couple. One of our characters is six years old at the beginning of the film, uh, and by the end, he is older than six. I should say, towards the end of the film, he is older than six, uh, and he's acting like an adult. And I'm like, hold on a second, you you only got school for a couple of years, man. You can't even do like you can't even do multiplication at this point, right? Division is beyond you. And you're you're like talking about grand ideas to get off the beach and it's like, are you 6 or aren't you? Like, hold on, how does this work? Like, and it's not clear. And the movie doesn't yeah. it doesn't do a good job of like laying those rules out for you. And the rules it does lay out, it later goes on to just kind of turn on its head and like I don't know. I I I felt like this movie was too long. I felt like the gimmick was not deep enough and it felt like they gave away too much in the trailers. Um, 
Well, they gave away too much because there wasn't much, much to give away. Yeah, like they had to, right? Like I, I remember seeing that original 30-second Super Bowl spot and telling you like, oh, God, I hope that movie's deeper than what it looks like because it looks like that whole movie's in 30 seconds. And I told, it's the yeah, I told you it wasn't going to be. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's the gimmick. Um, I, th I think what one thing comment I wanted to make about like the aging thing and the, how they just kind of bump up these these actors, what they really needed to do, and this would have been really difficult, they, they should have had like, 10 actors for each role and age different, you know, like, okay, the, the adults are like 30, like mid thirties. Okay. So you have someone at 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, like you, you should have had like 10 actors all aged like five years apart um, for everyone. And that would have been really difficult to do uh, probably, but you needed something to depict that aging so much better than just, you know, CGI makeup. And again, this is why I think, animation probably would work better why it probably works much better as a graphic novel because you can through those mediums very gradually depict the the aging process yeah I, I think you're right like the children at least get a few actors and actresses to kind of help them age up and they do a decent job um you know like you're not you're not convinced that six-year-old and thomas and mckenzie are the same person but like you throw somebody in between them it looks kind of similar okay all right yeah i i can see the gimmick here but the adults don't have that convenience it's just them the whole movie and it's like okay like what are, yeah what are we doing here like are, are we playing by rules or aren't we you know and like it doesn't it just I mean, does, it just, it's just cluster. Ah, it just, just screams budget cuts, you know. Yeah, it's it's just messy, and like from Shyamalan, you don't expect messy. You, you, it might be different, it might be weird, but it'll be clean execution. And this is not that way, um, which is really frustrating. I don't know. I, I don't expect much from Shyamalan these days, unfortunately. Me neither. From from the next Spielberg, man. Like we really we really seemed like something was going to happen, and lately he just seems to be in this weird spot. I, I feel like he he likes Zack Snyder. He needs somebody to come along with a red pen and go, "No, we're not doing this. This is bad." He just needs somebody to rein him in a little bit because his direction is okay. His cinematography is probably his best asset. His writing is just slipping, man. It really feels like it's slipping. And it's like, you got to do something, man. This is going to work. Yeah. I will say at this at the same time, like he's real hit and miss. And I think more misses than hits. But like, I'll still go, always go see an M. Night Shyamalan film because you never know. He might, he just might knock it out of the park. Yeah. You know, like Split yeah. was, a, was a big surprise. I really liked Split. Sure. There, there were a lot of parts of Glass I really liked. Like, they're, they're, again, a lot of his cinematography is solid. I mean, you can watch the trailer and see some of it. Some of those shots in the trailer look real good. Like, he gets, he does a great job of like catching a look or a moment that feels great. But a lot of his dialogue's really slipshod. It, it's just, yeah, I, I, the more I see, the less I've come to expect. And that's, that's a, sh that's, that's a bummer. So, and any other thoughts on old before recommendations? I'm ready. Andy, would you recommend old? I would say hard pass on this or uh, save it for streaming. If you are interested, uh, it's definitely not worth going out in theater. It's too long. It's misdirected. It's not scary. It's not thrilling. It's really kind of boring. Uh, I could go on. I don't want to bag on it too much, uh, but I would say skip it. Save it for streaming at, at best. Yeah, I'm going to be in the same boat. Save it for streaming at best. Even then, you probably don't need to see it. If you if you really like time movies and you're really interested, I feel like I would encourage you to go find the original graphic novel before you read the, before you watch this. Like I I think you'll have more to take away from it. This movie pulls pulls back the reins on the ending of that novel and it does something different and I don't think it I don't think it's better. And I haven't read the original work, and that's why I can't say for sure, but I just don't think old is the best way to dig into what this idea is supposed to be. This idea of a beach that makes you old. Like, there's got to be a better way to do it. So, I, I don't know. A miss from Shyamalan, in my opinion, and uh, that's old. Now, Andy, one more thing before we wrap up the episode. 150 episodes of Off Script. What an exciting... <laughs> what, a what, an exci what an exciting thing we've done here. Um... Any any thoughts on 150 episodes of what what this is we've been doing? I can go first if you want to take a minute and uh, yeah yeah you should go first because yeah. I was I think you asked me yeah. about like what films stand out now I can't remember anything I can't think I of know that. yeah I, I need to go back and look and I think that's the, that's the funny thing about being at, at, at where we're at now with the show um, you know it, it's hard to remember what all we've watched 
and, and you you'd think oh it'd be easy to remember a lot of these and, and sure a bunch of them yes i remember going and watching it for the show and having a great time other movies like we could go down a list I, I you could hit me at least with a list of, of films we've watched for the show obscure stuff you, you could tell it to me and i'd be like i've never seen that and so yeah you, you did and actually here's your review for the show you can go back and listen to and i'd be like oh god you're totally right and i think that's what what i one of the things I've really enjoyed about the show is, is being able to archive the experience of watching these films and having our initial reactions to them uh, in, in this kind of format that we can go back and pull back on and listen to later. You know, that stuff, that stuff really excites me. I, I don't listen to every episode of off script. Obviously I'm here for them, but I don't always go back and listen, but being able to, to roll back. To, <laughs> thank, you're, you're our number one fan, Andy, uh, being able to roll back to episode one or episode 30 or episode 50, or the first time I saw Isle of Dogs or the first time I saw Endgame, and kind of get my thoughts on that. Like that's a really cool kind of time capsule that we, that we've been putting together here. And, and that's one of, I think a handful of benefits I've been getting from the show. Yeah. I I mean, w- one of the, one of the things that I, I actually, before we started the podcast, I had attempted to start like a film review blog uh, at one point and I got like three reviews in and I was like, man, this takes forever. Cause it took me like two hours to write, uh, to write a review. Um you know, and that, that's a lot of writing if you're reviewing multiple films. And so what I, that's what I appreciate the most, I think, is that we have a time capsule of our thoughts of, of different um, films. Because sometimes you kind of forget how you feel a, about a movie. So it's nice to be able to go back and say, oh, yeah, these were my thoughts on, on this film. Yeah, for sure. And I, I know, you know, working on off script, we have not done a lot of proper like marketing and promotion for it. And we have a, we have a, we have a niche audience, we like to say. And that's OK, because ultimately, like, I think Andy and I just like watching movies and talking about them. <laughs> and and this show is a great excuse to do that, like in, in a way that, that we enjoy and is simple that we can look back on and we can say, oh, yeah, this is a cool thing we did. And, and um, man, I really just like going and seeing movies and talking about them. So you know, for everybody out there who's like, why don't you, why don't you guys market more and, and, and put out more this way or do that? Well, it's because it's not really about that. We just like watching movies. <laughs> and yeah, then yeah. We, ultimately, that's the reason you should do a show like this. I think it's the reason we've able we've been able to do 150 and have no plans of stopping. I mean, that's yeah, how the well, show well, started was we were like, well, we stand around and talk about movies. So let's turn on the mics. Yeah. Let's just start doing it the, here. And here we are. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Enjoying doing it. Don't ever plan to stop. Here's to episode 151, I guess. Yeah. That's right. Speaking right. Of, of episode 151. Yeah. What are we watching next week? Um, we got a c- couple of new releases. Uh, first is the Ryan Reynolds uh, action video game thing called Free Guy, uh, which opens this Friday in theaters exclusively on August 13th. And we also have a new action film coming out on Netflix called Beckett, starring uh, John David Washington as kind of a. It looks a little bit like James Bond. He's a spy who's been, uh, you know, been made or, or whatever. He, he's he got to do spy things and punch people. It looks a lot of fun. So it's called Beckett, and that's on Netflix this Friday. Uh, I'm curious, Andy. Uh, how how excited are you for Free Guy? Because I'm like a, a solid, I'm probably low excitement. Like I've seen so many trailers, right? We've seen this, that whole film already. This is one of those things I do for the love of the podcast. Yes, for sure. Uh, because this is this was another, you know, essentially Panderic, pa- Panderic, Pandora, pan, pandemic, pan, film. yeah, panoramic. Thank you, thank you. Pa- pandemic film that was uh, delayed and delayed and pushed off, and it's finally coming out. And so now we're going to see what all the all the hubbub was about, and you know why this wasn't just going to go straight to streaming. Uh, so we'll see. So no, I'm not very excited, but um. We'll see. I like video games, so yeah, for sure. As for Beckett, like I'm a little worried. It's it's straight to Netflix for a reason, right? I'm a little concerned that it's just going to be like a flat thriller. But but John David Washington is good, man. He hasn't turned out a bad performance yet. Even Malcolm Marie was good in. I feel I have reached a point now where like when something's coming out on Netflix, I'm just not excited for it. When you I just see, assume it's bad, yeah. yeah. When I see something, when I see like uh, you know, when I'm scrolling the the film forums and I see. Oh, new new film trailer starring this great actor coming to Netflix. I skip it. I'm not. I'm not even watching trailers now. <laughs> like if it's going to Netflix, like that's that's the level we've. That's how much of it hurt. 
Yeah. Well, we are excited for you to hear our review of these two films, of course, and and we're mildly excited to go see them. I promise. So thank you for listening to 150 episodes of Off Script. And if you liked what you heard and you want to hear more and you want to keep up with what we're doing the show, the easiest way to do that is to subscribe. Just subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting platform so you can keep up with new episodes of Off Script when they come out every single Tuesday, unless we take the week off. We're on Facebook where we live stream the show every Tuesday evening at about 5 p.m. Central. So if you want to check us out, come follow us over there. Leave a like, leave a comment. All right. Let us know what you got going on or movies you want to see. We're on YouTube, we're on Twitter, on Instagram. You can keep us up, keep up with us over there as well. But the biggest thing you could do to support the show, just subscribe. Just subscribe to the show. Maybe tell a friend. Uh, sharing is a big step. All right. Well, we, we, we can share later, but for now, just subscribe, maybe rate and review we can do that next week. Anyway, from all of us to off script, thank you for participating in 150 episodes of the show. We've enjoyed doing it as much as we hope you've enjoyed listening to it. And from all of us from off script, the home of bolt cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for listening.